Welcome to video two of our second chemistry unit of year 10 science. In this video, we're going to be looking at the collision theory. The outcomes that we'll be covering in this video are outcome three and four, where we observe and understand that chemical reactions take place at different rates. So we'll be looking at that a bit in this one. We'll also be looking at that a bit in the next video. Um, you're also going to recognize the principles behind the collision theory and be able to apply this theory to explain different reaction rates. Okay, so the key with the collision theory, which is basically about particles colliding, is this is why reactions happen. So let's review what you already know about particles, okay? And basically, back in year eight, you would have looked at the particle theory, okay? And you would have looked that solids had nice uniformly arranged particles that only vibrated, they didn't, the particles didn't move around. Um, then a liquid that lost that uniform structure as such. They're still quite closely packed, um, but they can move past each other. And then our gas, where it, there's no fixed shape as such. Those particles fly randomly around. Okay, and you would have le learned the names of the changes in state. So melting and melting, where solid moves to the liquid form by... Um, energy transfers, and then we've got that liquid to the gas, evaporation, going the opposite direction, the gas to the liquid known as condensation, and our liquid back to the solid known as solidification. Now, you can see there's arrows right at the top and at the bottom that are saying, but moving between the solid to the liquid of gas, we increase the kinetic energy in the particles, so they move around more. And if we go from the gas back towards the solid, we're decreasing that kinetic energy. So if you think about it, in which one are our particles likely to um, collide with a lot of energy? Well, with a lot of energy, it would be the gas, but the chance of them colliding is less because they're randomly moving around unless we change a few factors. Okay, whereas the solid, they're not going to collide because they're in their uniform structure and they can't move. So this is where we're looking at in terms of this collision theory and what it's got to do with our um, particle theory. So we've always called it particle theory, but we're going to go up a step now and we're going to call it the kinetic molecular theory. OK, kinetic molecular theory. Um, and this is what's used to explain the behaviours of molecules. So you've always called it the particle theory, which it is. But we're going one step further and calling it the kinetic molecular theory from now on. OK, so we've reviewed the particle theory. If any of that was not didn't make so much sense to you, just read through those points and make some notes. Alrighty, so as I said, thinking of the collision thing theory and we're now thinking of chemical reactions. So we've got this connect, kinetic molecular theory, we've got the collision theory, and we've got chemical reactions. How does this all come together? Well, basically, we need atoms to bump together to collide for a chemical reaction to take place. Now, there's two things, though, two points that we need to occur. It's not just about two molecules colliding. They actually need to collide with the right bits touching. OK, so it's not as simple as I'm just bashing into each other. The, the specific parts need to bash into each other. We'll look at that soon. And also, there needs to be a certain amount of energy when they collide. If they just touch, a chemical reaction may not occur, but there's got to be a certain amount of energy involved to make a reaction take place. If only one of those conditions are met, so if they collide with the right amount of energy, but they collide at the wrong point of the molecule, then a reaction won't occur. If they collide at the right part of the molecule, but without enough energy, a reaction won't occur. Let's have a look at these a bit further. 
Okay, so in terms of orientation, we have got some carbon monoxide, which is going to collide with an oxygen molecule. What we're trying to form or what would form here if they collide correctly is carbon dioxide. OK, so basically an oxygen will be removed from the oxygen molecule to make carbon dioxide. In the top diagram, you'll see that the oxygens are colliding with the oxygens. Now, both oxygens there have got a full outer shell. They don't need another molecule. So even though, though, though they collide with the right amount of energy, no reaction occurs. If you look down the bottom, OK, here, you can see the carbon and the oxygen are colliding. Well, hello, these two, they want to connect. OK, so a reaction does occur. The two oxygens disassociate and we end up with carbon dioxide forming. So carbon and two oxygens and off goes that oxygen to find another carbon. OK, here, as I said, no reaction occurred. The wrong orientation. This is all completely random how this occurs. Okay, so you've got three sets of notes there. All right, about the orientation. If it made sense to you what I've said, you don't need to write all those down, just summarize what I've said. Okay, now we talk about the energy. So we've talked about the molecules colliding with the right amount, um, at the right orientation. Now they need to collide with the right amount of energy. Okay, so here, the top line, you can see the hydrogen and the chlorine, they're coming together, but they just kind of meet together, not enough energy, so nothing happens and off they go. Here they come together much faster, there's more energy, they collide with a reaction occurring, and we have new products. So the collision must involve a certain amount of energy, we said that. Converting reactants to products requires the particles to break the bonds between the initial reactants to form those new products. Okay. If the reactants do not collide with enough energy, they just bounce off, no reaction occurs. But how much energy is enough energy? So all reactions need some energy to get them going. And we call this our activation energy. And you may see that written as a capital E with the subscript A. Okay, so if you look at the diagram here, energy is needed to get that reactant to be um, the bonds in it breaking up and the new bonds to form. Okay. So the collision must occur with energy equal or greater to what is required in the activation energy. So you even need the right amount of activation energy or more. Any less and a reaction will not occur. We've already said in our previous video that bond breaking is endothermic, so energy is taken in. So we need to put in some energy to break those bonds in the reactions. The minimum amount of energy to get that reaction going, as we said, is our activation energy, that EA. Now, you might see these graphs. We call these energy profiles. Okay, and you'll see the in the first one, this is our exothermic reaction. So energy is released. The energy amount in the reactants, okay, is more than the energy there is in the product. So that's the amount of energy, potential energy, stored energy in the reactants. So there's more. We start off with more in the reactants than the product. So energy must have been released. Okay, and there we've got our activation energy to get that reaction going. And then the energy is released. Here in our endothermic reaction, we start off with that energy in our reactant there. Our activation energy, how much energy is put in. And then our products have more energy in them than the reactants. 
So energy must have been taken in in that reaction, so it was endothermic. So typically, an exothermic reaction will have a lower activation energy than an endothermic because it's going to use some of the energy already in the reactants as such. And that is the end of our video on the collision theory. I look forward to seeing you in our next video, which is all about the rate of reactions.